Good morning, everybody. This is our session, uh, workshop number 401 on uh, inclusion online, diverse knowledge, new rules. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've had many registrations. I'm glad some of you also showed up. Thanks for, for being here, for taking the time. Um, my name is Jan Gerlach. I'm a senior public policy manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit that hosts and supports Wikipedia and uh, several other projects of free knowledge uh, that people around the world can uh, freely participate in and share. Um, I am very happy today to be uh, joined uh, by wonderful colleagues over here, um, which I will um, introduce in a minute. Um, maybe for a brief um, agenda of today, um, we will briefly, or I will briefly frame um, the topic and introduce our speakers. Um, we will then have a uh, discussion of roughly 50 minutes, followed by a open Q&A, for which we will take um, questions from, from the room, but also um, from remote participants, hopefully. If you are participating remotely, please feel free to type in your questions um, into the um, Zoom app. Um, we will park them for later uh, for the, for the Q&A, but um, you can go ahead and, and type in your questions that you have for the speakers. Um, and finally, we will um, find some conclusions and wrap up the session um, shortly before 1 p.m. So we have roughly um, 90 minutes actually for this session, which is great um, and should allow us for some in-depth conversation here. Um, to, to briefly um, frame w what we were envisioning um, is the concept or, or a proposal for this session is to really explore uh, potential governance responses to the diverse interests of new groups um, and new roles and responsibilities of different sectors for the people who are coming online. Uh, we can call them newcomers, we can call them people who um, are the, the, the real digital natives. Um, it's a, this is about basically finding um, ways to allow people to meaningfully participate even if they're, they haven't been part of um, rulemaking and policy making until now. So um, topics that we can explore here are maybe a need for flexibility of such norms so newcomers can contribute and shape them also in ways that are accommodating of their diverse needs. Um, a, ten a possible topic is also the tension between freedom of expression and inclusion, if there is something like that. Self-governance, citizenship and participation. I'd like to touch upon diversity and youth as a special topic, gender as well. And possibly, if we find the time, the role of languages and also scripts um, and how those influence governance and policy making for people around the world that may come from different backgrounds. Um, from a Wikimedia perspective, and allow me as a moderator to briefly speak on this, um, unfortunately one of our panelists um, from Wikimedia um, can't be here, so I, I will briefly share our perspective, even though I don't really like to do that as a moderator to intervene too much. Um, so bear with me. Um, from, from a Wikimedia perspective, we believe that everybody around the world should be able to uh, freely participate in, in knowledge and um, be able to contribute not only knowledge but also to the rules that govern knowledge and how it can be shared and read and um, expressed online. So we believe that just connecting the unconnected, um, as we hear very often at conferences like the IGF, isn't enough. Um, our goal is really to make sure that people have meaningful access, can meaningfully participate in democratic, distributed ways, that they can feel safe um, and share their knowledge because we benefit from them, all of us do. So I'm really happy that um, with, it, with this background, um, I'm really happy that um, the following four speakers that, you, uh, that are sitting to my left here um, are joining us today. On I'll just go um, through my, I think, um, actually alphabetic list here. <laughs> um, on one hand, I have um, Deborah Albu from ITS Rio in Brazil, 
Um, she's a program coordinator um, for democracy and technology um, at the Institute for Technology and Society in Brazil. She holds a, a master in science in gender and development. Next is Santiago Amador, who is um, an innovation advisor to the mayor of Bogota. He holds a master's degree in public administration from Harvard and a master's degree in social science um, of the internet from the University of Oxford. He was the national director of internet policy at the Ministry of ICT of Colombia and currently is coordinator of the Innovation Lab for Public Services at the Bogotá's mayor, Mayor's Office and Professor of Public Innovation in the National School for Public Servants. Um, joining also is Chennai Chair, um, who is a research manager focused on gender and digital rights at the Web Foundation. Chennai has extensi extensively focused on understanding demand side issues with regards to the digital policy from a gender and youth perspective. She's currently also a member of the IGF MAG in her second term. Finally, we have Amos Toh, who is um, the senior researcher on AI and human rights at Human Rights Watch. He was previously legal advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression, David Kay. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, um, for this conversation, I um, hope to take a relatively light approach to moderation and um, Amos, I think, called it an anarchic um, approach, but um, I, I just hope for a lively conversation. Please feel free to also ask each other questions here. Um, and if you in the room have questions, please um, make a mental note and ask uh, during the Q&A unless it's super pressing. <laughs> um, so I'm interested um, in, in exploring the questions that um, I outlined earlier. And maybe we need to first take stock of, of the rules that, that really govern participation online. Um, just for 10 seconds here, we have, of course, international treaties, we have laws, we have regulations, but then we also have terms of services, uh, terms of service, terms of um, uh, use of platforms, and of, of course, also uh, internet service providers and also um, app stores. But we also have community standards within platforms, and maybe within those platforms, different fora may have their own moderation rules. So there's a whole sort of network, and it gets more granular um, in, of rules and norms that govern um, how people can participate online. Um, and, and it's important to keep in mind that, that we're not just talking about laws here. Not at all, actually. Um, so, my first question, maybe, maybe to you, Jenai, is um, who is actually coming online? Um, are there, what are we seeing? Who are the regions and groups that are coming online today and that are newly connected or maybe have connections but are now just finding the ways to, to be part of the online world? Um, thank you so much for starting off with me. It's always fun to set the scene for everybody else. So when you think about who's coming online, uh, the International Telecommunications Un Union recently released its results to show the state of levels of access. And what you find from a European perspective, almost everyone is connected. Almost everyone has some form of access to the internet, whereas least developing countries and developing countries are the ones that are still coming up when it, when it comes to levels of connection. Africa has the lowest percentage of internet users according to the ITU, standing at 28.2%, um, compared to Europe with 82.5% um, in terms of internet users. If you, but take it down a lower level into the African countries, you actually find that South Africa is probably one of the leading countries when it comes to internet access, with almost over half the population having making use to the internet. And then in terms of really answering your question from who's actually coming online, you would find that it's, um, to some extent, it's people with some form of access to economic income, which are probably in the range, age ranges of 17 to 35, because now they have access to work opportunities and are able to afford buying a device and are being also able to afford buying um, the necessary data to allow for you to come online. And then what we do understand and what is agreed upon is that we do have a gendered digital divide. So what we find is that there are more men coming online in comparison to women. 
And then when we do really break it down at that, because these are not homo homogeneous groups, you find is that urban men, men who are in urban spaces and uh, have access to high levels of income, are the ones that are leading the charge. And then you find, then you take it to a rural and urban, you find that it's more likely to be urban women in comparison to rural women who are actually coming in online from um, the areas that we're coming into. So then I haven't done as much uh, age disaggregated work, but then you find that it's, it's that range that I was talking about of the 17 to um, 34, 35 that are the ones that are coming online. And then as you move up in the older range, you have fewer, fewer older people that are actually coming in online. So those are the demographics that we need to take into account. And the age thing is also really because um, least developing countries also have the youngest populations. So that is likely the context in which we're seeing that younger people are coming online, but it's more mainly men who are leading the charge. Thank you. Thanks, Chennai. Um, and maybe um, since we touched upon youth um, at the very uh, end of Chennai's um, framing here, Deborah, can you maybe talk to us a little bit about uh, what do you see in, in your research around youth coming online, um, obviously as a subset of the newcomers, um, if I may use that clumsy framing. Um, what do you see? What are their needs and, and how, um, how can they participate? Um, thank you, Ian, for the presentation. Thank you also for organizing this session. Um, just, I think it's interesting um, the way that uh, Shanai was putting it as um, she was moving along all these uh, different demographic categories. What we see is maybe uh, an important concept to, to highlight, which is the one of intersectionality here. So um, the more we have layers of oppression that might exclude and exclude and exclude these populations from coming online, we can actually understand that it is not the same thing to be a young woman in Brazil as it is to being a young woman in countries of Europe, to put it in a more general way. Um, so this is maybe a, a first idea or concept to, to take into consideration when we're, when we're talking about young people. Um, in well, uh, recent research from ITU, from uh, UNICEF, etc. Um, young people are coming online, but there are many barriers to how they are coming online. Um, maybe one of the first ones is to talk even about the possibility for them to have devices to access the internet. Um, how can young people access the internet and buy devices if they're not affordable? So affordability here might be one of these first barriers. And once even they have uh, these devices, how can then they move forward to uh, actually purchasing uh, data packages and um, accessing good internet quality? Uh, so that's maybe a second layer um, that even makes it harder for young people to access the internet. And maybe um, a third, and here just to, to put it um, a little bit as we move um, along the conversation, is the idea of parental medi mediation as well. Um, many young people don't have access to their own devices, but do use their parents' devices to access the internet. So how um, is their access to uh, internet information knowledge online mediated by their parents? Um, so I think maybe just to start, these are a few barriers that we can um, underlie um, in terms of talking about young people online, but I'm sure we'll move on and talk about other barriers as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, looking at you, Santiago, um, we, we've had a conversation recently about uh, rural areas in Colombia coming on coming online and calling you, apparently. Um, um, is against the background or the, the, um, what we just heard from Chennai and also f from Deborah, um, maybe, maybe moving away from the youth chapter uh, topic just a tiny bit, um, who, are the, who are the people who are coming online in, in, in rural areas? Um, is, is there anything that we can learn from Colombia here? Yes, um, could you? 
Could you switch to the presentation, please, just for a bit? Um, I, I just want to use one slide. I think it's, it's enough. Uh, this is the typical discourse that we politicians uh, give in a rural area when, you, when we are deploying computers and internet. So we say exactly this. I was the, the director of internet policy there, and I remember to say something very similar like this. Uh, thanks to the internet, every citizen can access from any place to all the information they need, and they use it to improve their lives and participate freely in a global discussion. So this is a very like a common discourse of a politician. But if you see, I mean, in detail, not every citizen is accessing, not from any place, not to all information, uh, not necessarily they're using the, imp the information to improve their lives, uh, and they don't, they are not participating uh, freely, and they're not, they are not part of the global discussions. So uh, I, I, I. I like to do this exercise um, just to point to point out that uh, there are a lot of barriers for rural people to access the, uh, the internet. Language is one of them. Uh, in, in, in a country uh, as Colombia, it is very difficult that people from rural areas are, uh, I mean, they, they don't know how to speak in English, and most of the content is produced uh, in English, for instance. Uh, connectivity there, is, uh, uh, I mean, the speed of connectivity is very low, so they cannot access to, for instance, to, to videos or to uh, higher education. Uh, it, it is very difficult for them. Um, uh, and also, uh, I mean, we, we are studying gaps uh, or digital divides, and there is not just one digital divide. We, we found seven different digital divides. And the one is the, I mean, the worst uh, of them is a gap of intention. It is very different, the intention to use the internet when you are in a city and you are well-educated and you are uh, maybe young, that, that they, the same intention when you are in rural areas. So basically, they don't have, sometimes they don't have the interest or the intention to use uh, the network or to, to use the internet to actually participate. Maybe because, because they are not a, a literate in some, I mean, they, they are not writing and reading properly or in the way that, that the discussions require. Um, they are not bilingual. They don't, they don't uh, have access to credit cards, so they cannot pay anything in, in the internet. They cannot access to those documents that are, uh, are behind the paywall, for instance. Um, yeah, I mean, all of the social divides amplifies within the internet. Thank you, Santiago. I really, I really like that, that notion of the intention gap. Let's maybe come to that later, uh, come back to that later. Amos, turning to you, um, I think you, you probably saw this coming. What, what are the rights of all these groups that we are talking about now? Um, what are their human rights um, to participate and how does that look before we go into um, maybe a more detailed conversation about the challenges and how we can de redesign maybe norms? So, um, so I'm gonna to respond to that question, but first I just want to add a bit to um, some of the really interesting discussion on barriers to access online um, in the sense that some of our research, um, particularly in, on uh, digital welfare systems, show that this, people who are experiencing barriers um, to coming online are nevertheless forced online uh, to access essential public services, and, and that's really increasingly a, a problem. We see that um, particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, where the flagship welfare program known as Universal Credit is effectively forcing some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in society to access their benefits online, even though they don't have the resources, as people have explained here, to do so, or necessarily the requisite literacy um, to, to, to kind of put participate in that way online, right? Um, so, so that's kind of another dimension to this debate. And, and so then that brings me to your question of, of the range of human rights, right? So quite obviously, it, you know, I think um, a freedom of expression is affected and particularly uh, access to information. But in a component of freedom of expression that's not really talked about is freedom of opinion. Right, um, to the extent that not just the way we speak, but the way we think, 
right, is affected by issues of access or being forced online um, or what we see online. Um, that's also kind of an unexplored issue. But I, I do think that there is also kind of social economic rights here that are impacted, the right to social security, but also uh, many other related rights. Thanks, Amos. Um, so we, we briefly already touched upon challenges and barriers. Um, when we when we look at um, I'd say new regions um, where where the next billion the unconnected currently are coming online maybe they are already connected but they don't really have the means to fully participate what what are the the, the barriers that that you see to, for uh, participation in discourse so say somebody actually has a device they have access to the device. Um, they um, may have also the economic means to spend time. Given we, assuming we have overcome all those barriers, do, do um, the, the newly connected uh, actually find a, an environment? Do the norms that we have currently on platforms such as probably Facebook, maybe Twitter, others, um, afford them to, to meaningfully participate, Chennai? Um, thank you so much for that question. So I have two examples which I found fascinating. The first one is, um, so, uh, to quote um, Alison Gould from Research ICT Africa, she's de defined it as the digital paradox online where while we're talking about people who are coming online, there's actually a difference between those who have certain levels of um, access to education and income and how they engage online versus those who now do have the resources to engage online but lack that kind of nuance in terms of the critical thinking involved with participating online. So that's one framing to it. Um, the two examples I'm, I'm, are my favorite, which I've picked up when we were talking about women's safety online, is how from South Africa, men are trash is a very important political call to action in terms of violence against women. However, women found themselves using this term on Facebook and then being kicked off the platform or being reported for misbehavior on the platform. So already what you then find is that there are community guidelines that have been set up, but who exactly are they protecting? So in engaging with Facebook, they have pointed out that, listen, we are trying to create, one of the lines against discrimination is that all genders will be respected and everyone may have access to the platform. But if it, this is my rallying call to action for something that is of context relevant, then that means that as a new person coming in online, I'm likely to find myself on Facebook jail for a very long time because my favorite call is men are trash. So then, um, so that's one example and then I, I think in terms of setting up community guidelines and the barriers that then affect people is what um, was rightly mentioned around the freedom of opinion. Whilst we are championing some of these rights for people to engage online, to what extent do we actually extend that freedom of opinion in these offline spaces? Because I think in an offline space, it's quite easy to walk away from a conversation, but in an online space, um, you're going to get a screenshot is going to be done and then the point is going to constantly come back to you, especially if you're someone who occupies a position of power or especially if you're generally a woman, whatever you say, someone's always going to come back to it. So I think some of the barriers are perceptions around what is um, a relevant freedom, like what is the right guideline, who does it benefit at the end of the day and who designs that to actually say, listen, this is the community guideline that needs to be set up to protect people on these platforms and then how is it communicated back to the citizens who actually come on these platforms. I'm not sure if Facebook has an orientation for when you've signed up for an account, this is how we expect you to behave. But most of the times it's only when you have access to spaces like these or if these communities actually then do have a session where we come and hear what the guidelines are, it becomes my responsibility to go back to my community to actually say, if you want to publish something on Wikipedia, this is what you need to follow. So I think those are the barriers in terms of um, skills, capacity, and engagement around what is the right um, behavior online. Thank you. So, so maybe if I understand correctly, you're, there should be almost somewhat a mentorship uh, for those people coming online. I mean, here are the rules, right? Take people by the hand. I mean, in a, in a hopefully not so paternalistic way, like this is what you're expected to do. Um, but do those rules that would be communicated right now actually help everybody around the world? And it's probably already um, 
almost blasphemic or blasphemy for this uh, conference um, that runs under the motto One World, One Net, One Vision. But I want to ask the question, do we actually really get to a place of participation for everybody with one set of rules for everybody around the world. And if I can sort of toot Wikipedia's horn here a little bit, uh, the Wikipedia language versions around the world, um, there's 300 language versions and they all have um, sort of common sets of rules, but they do differ because people um, negotiate those rules uh, for conduct and content uh, within their language communities. And um, they follow sort of a common set of principles, but they are different for different language communities. Um, is there room for that at all um, for, for, um, for other platforms? Amos, if I can ask you that. Um, so, I, I mean, I think this kind of leads into discussion about like some of the incentive structures that are um, set up by um, platforms that are you know not run by, by volunteers and, and I, I do think that um, some of the instru incentive structures are just simply not aligned with the kind of ground up um, development of rules that you know may be. Um, may have come of like thrived in, in the Wikimedia, Wikipedia context, right? Um, so one set of rules that I think that we don't necessarily talk about enough, right, in addition to community standards and guidelines is um, advertising friendly content guidelines, which really determines what kind of content is monetized and demonetized and if financial incentives is a huge incentive for what content is being um, uploaded and in some ways even recommended um, and prioritized on these platforms, then, you know, like I think we won't necessarily get the ground up kind of um, rules ecosystem that, you know, has thrived on Wikimedia and in fact is very much controlled by uh, advertising interests, right? And I can go a bit more into that. Um, in fact, but, but let me just kind of, and I was doing some research today and I just looked at some of the rules on advertising uh, advertiser-friendly content guidelines, and you can imagine the kind of content that is prioritized, right? So on YouTube, for example, what may be um, subject to limited monetization or demonetization uh, are controversial issues and sensitive events such as war, death and tragedies, political conflicts, and co content that is made to appear appropriate for a general audience but contains adult themes, including sex, violence, and vulgarity. And then on Facebook, um, under a tiered monetization system, debated social issues um, are subject to limited monetization if um, they focus on a debated social issue uh, that has little on, um, that has, um, that, that, that uses language or gestures that could be considered confrontational or controversial. So, so you can imagine a kind of incentive structures that are set up on these platforms that I don't think you would get on a volunteer-run platform like Wikipedia. I'm intrigued by this. Um, so ad rules essentially govern the spaces where our public online discourses are happening. Yes, they, I think they shape it to some extent. So I think there's the issue of whether content is left up on the platform or left down, right? And that's the community standards kind of review pipeline and you know the legal restrictions that may also apply. But I think then there's the issue of what, uh, what content is incentivized, right? And that kind of leads to kind of um, issues around monetization and demonetization. And also it's unclear how much impact um, these standards on advertising friendly, uh, advertising friendly content, such a like <laughs> a lot of words for some reason. Um, uh, uh, that those standards, you know, it's unclear whether there's a link between those standards and a recommendation systems on these platforms that determine what content is prioritized on newsfeed, for example. Thank you. Super interesting. Um, maybe coming back to you, Santiago, um, from a public sector perspective. Um, the, our political discourses, our public discourse, obviously shoot, um, moves to the internet. Um, as Amos has told us, people are forced onto the internet to actually benefit from public services often, mm -hmm. um, whether they want it or not. 
how 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 does a government uh, maybe like yours uh, think of of um, these public discourses happening in a platform that may be opaque and where rules such as ad rules may actually shape the discourse is there maybe a need for for um, for for a for a different kind of platform maybe um, I'm not sure. Can one ask that? Is there does there need have to be a government platform even? Like what? How can democratic discourse happen elsewhere? Um, just I, I want to say something uh, else at the beginning, and it, it is that um, I think one trend is is damaging uh, participation in in the public sphere in, on the internet, and is the zero rated apps. I mean mainly. Uh, people from uh, low socioeconomic strata and rural areas are accessing the internet, but uh, they cannot afford a, f a full uh, internet plan. So they ended up, uh, uh, I mean, having uh, just WhatsApp plan, you know, or maybe just Facebook plan. So a lot of Colombians in socioeconomic strata, one and two, are just accessing private conversations. They, they are on internet and they answer that they, they are in, uh, using internet, on in the internet, but they, uh, they are not actually participating on, on, on conversations. Um, it used to be different uh, when net neutrality was the, the trend and the principle, but not anymore. So I, I think this is one of the things that we have to do something about it. Uh, but I don't think that a government, uh, I mean, for, for two reasons. I don't think that a, that a government can actually uh, promote uh, and compete with a private platform. I think it sounds absurd in, in, in current times. And also because people just don't want to be in the government platform. I mean, it happens a lot that, that, that uh, a public agency creates an app and nobody wants to have this app. And you, ha you have just a limited amount of, of capacity in, in your cell phone and you always prefer to, uh, to erase the, the public app and, and keep Facebook and keep Instagram or may yeah, maybe and keep, uh, of course, WhatsApp. So I think uh, there is nothing that a government could do uh, different uh, from, from being better in closing uh, social gaps. I mean, the best internet policy for me uh, at this point is to close the social gaps, the gender gaps, the income gaps, the age gaps in the using of the internet. So we are so focused uh, on regulating the internet, but I think the problem is more systemic that, that, than regulate the internet. Thank you, um, super interesting. Um, so maybe if the public app, a public platform isn't the solution, and I was kind of expecting that answer. Um, so how do we actually make sure that, that the people who, who should, who we want to engage in, in public discourse and democratic discourse, how do we make sure they are able to shape the rules um, under which they have to um, basically uh, live on platforms? Deborah, in your research, how can we make, maybe you have ideas for us, how can we make sure those people are heard um, in, in ways that, that enable them to, to meaningfully participate? Um, thank you. Um, maybe a good start is to say how many young people I see in this room, uh, which is great, actually, uh, and to see that these people are coming into the conversation, literally. <laughs> Uh, in maybe one of the most privileged spaces as well. Um, so I think in that sense, this could be a good way to start on how to include uh, these marginalized groups is to give them a seat at the table. Um, and maybe just to uh, touch on some points as we went uh, into the conversation. Um, zero rating is also something that is happening in Brazil. So. Um, People only have access to WhatsApp in many uh, of the cheaper uh, data packages, and this is a problem, right? Because sometimes this is the internet. This is what people know um, as the internet. And this is, first, not um, the 
should it shouldn't be the the main resource of information right uh, on whatsapp or facebook or whatever people should have access to everything that is online so um net neutrality is also an issue i just wanted to echo that um and talking specifically about our region and talking specifically about our country um and i think there is again on 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 that sense in that sense Another issue which is regarding what type of content is available online. So we already discussed language, for example. Um, but I think we haven't come at uh, disinformation and misinformation yet. And this is also an issue when we're talking about um, young people or marginalized peoples in general. Um, how are these people accessing good information, good quality information, and if they are, how can they make uh, a good use of that, a meaningful use of that? Um, so maybe um, to, to, to answer your question on how can we <coughs> guarantee that, to some extent is yes, giving these people uh, a seat at the table so that they are the ones discussing the policies, they are the ones discussing the rules. Um, and yeah, um, I'll again uh, stop here and then we continue. So regarding language and, and community standards, but also maybe intentions, um, Jinai has brought up that um, example of, of women posting men are trash on, on Facebook. At scale, I think we all agree that these community standards that may or may not prevent um, that kind of language or content can only be policed through automated means. Um, and I know you, Amos, have done quite some research around that automation of processes on, on platforms. Does that even work for, for the problem that we are actually trying to, to explore today? Can automatic means um, or automatic um, content detection systems judge context? Can they uh, make sure that people can find the content, the legal content that they want to see online and, and that they are able to, to participate, not just find, but also share, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are several kinds of automated systems, um, as far as we know, that are operating on the big kind of commercial social media platforms. Um, I, I think obviously we see um, automated flagging systems, right, that flag either content that's legally restricted or that may um, lead to violations of community standards. And to the com to companies' credit, they have like really emphasized that you know they use it as flagging um, rather than uh, automatic takedown mechanisms. Um, and then you know there is aut the automation where I think there might be. Um, some level of automated takedowns happening is in um, the automation of um, enforcement of advertising friendly content guidelines. Um, and this is where we see um, some issues about some of these criteria, such as criteria for sexually explicit content potentially becoming a proxy uh, for disproportionate demonetization of LGBT uh, content, for example. And that actually kind of has culminated in a lawsuit against YouTube in the United States by LGBTQ uh, content creators, right? And then the third area of automation that we see that is potentially also problematic from a human rights perspective is in um, recommendation algorithms, right? Recommendation systems um, that automate um, what the prioritization of particular kinds of content over others. I want to say that, you know, sometimes we think about automated systems as kind of standalone systems, but the ways in which these are deployed and the purposes for which these are deployed are dictated by these companies, right? And actually, I'd be curious to hear if I can turn the question back over to you because I've heard this before about how Wikimedia uses automated systems and it's a very, very different use from commercial platforms, right, as I understand. Thanks, always happy to speak about that, of course. Um, so just quickly, yeah, we, at Wikipedia, um, there are no ads, so there are also um, no rules that would govern monetization or demonetization of, of content around ads or recommendations like that. 
Um, there, are, um, there is one system that is currently being developed and also already deployed for some areas of Wikipedia um, that is called the Objective uh, Revision Evaluation System, uh, which is a system, ORIS, short, um, that basically um, evaluates edits, um, new changes to Wikipedia articles and whole articles, um, and basically um, sort of helps editors judge whether um, an edit is bad, is vandalism, is disruptive to the encyclopedia or not. Um, however, it does not make automatic um, decisions about removal. It basically flags editors. We call that sort of a system of AI plus human review, AI just being sort of the umbrella term here, of course, um, for machine learning systems. Um, and we believe that essentially it should be editors, so humans making the call whether um, this is context dependent, good, and a, a good edit or a bad edit. Um, and that is, um, that really helps editors to basically evaluate uh, things more quickly because there are people, pat so-called patrollers, who just look at all the new edits coming in um, and they save a lot of time if they're just flagged for bad edits rather than going through every edit by themselves, right? So they just look at the possibly bad edits. And so that's sort of, uh, like the first example that we have are working on, um, the first such system, and that really also, I would say, exemplifies how we think about um, AI, that it should really aid people to improve discourse rather than shape discourse. Yeah, and just so to follow up on that, I think that's a really um, good contrast for illustrating that it's not necessarily automation per se that's the issue, but the social, uh, and technical structures in which it's embedded, right? So, in the you know in the context of community standards review, right, what automated detection systems are being used on the big commercial platforms is really to enable, um, you know, um, em employees or independent contractors contracted but working for the company to enforce top-down community standards, right? But then you know a similar kind of automated detection system. Um, may be used in the Wikimedia context quite differently to help kind of community appointed editors kind of evaluate um, edits, right? And so it's a more kind of democratic structure in which automation is serving. Thanks, Amos. Um, always good to, to hear that, that perspective on the work that we do. Um, Chennai, going, going back to this um, Example that you that you noted about um, the uh, women posting men are trash. Um, how how can you push back as as a group that is possibly pushing certain boundaries, certainly pushing community standards as they exist now? What are what can people do to actually to actually make sure they are heard? If, if um, it doesn't have to be that example. Youth are often pushing boundaries. Arts is, right? So if you are basically removed, if your content is current, constantly removed from a platform and apparently the norms need to somehow change, how can you engage with a platform to, to get that done? How do you do this? Or how does, is this currently being done? Um, thank you so much. So, um, I mean, I think one of the big strategies has been people voting with their feet, literally leaving the platform and going elsewhere. But I mean, with Facebook, you think you've left the platform, but you know, you're still somewhere, still tied to it. So you find that, um, for, I know for a lot of young people, they're actually, well not for a lot, for those young people with access to the internet and good phones, they're moving away from Facebook and going to platforms like TikTok. But now there's a whole um, issue going around with TikTok and online bullying and what it means and like racial content. So, I'm not going to touch on TikTok for now. But coming from um, like feminist communities and trying to understand women's participation online and um, that gender diverse approach to it is that we've then gone on to create strategies where the engagement is that if this platform does not allow for us to have this particular conversation and if it results in some of our community members being cut off from the platform, then the question is then you create alternative platforms. And you find that, I think someone, I uh, met someone at an event yesterday who created a um, Twitter for sex workers. I mean, like, it resembled Twitter, but it allowed for them to engage without being flagged and without being taken off and then 
for to engage with their own rights, on, online rights. So you find that there's a need to create alternative spaces. And I think there's also a need for, um, the reason why Facebook, WhatsApp, and those concentrated platforms are popular is because you're able to curate your own content as according to who it's coming to, and you can actually get it in the language that you understand. And in most of our cases, it's cheaper. It's cheaper to access it than to go beyond those platforms. So the question becomes, how do we then create, I mean, if you're talking about using arts, how then do we create communication and speak to our communities that, for example, if you're a, a young woman who's an entrepreneur and now there is an online shop on Instagram, that should not be your stopping point. You should actually move to other platforms so that when your page gets taken down because you violated community guidelines, you have your content elsewhere. So I think that now is work that comes from the educational training we need to invest beyond these online platforms. Yes, we can have an internet governance forum that's focusing on how do we make the platforms work, but I think one of the mandates for me personally I would like to see is that if we're looking at education, as people who work within the internet governance space, we now need to deal with educators who are not necessarily in this room. They are the ones that are developing the curriculums, they are the ones that are teaching students, and they are the ones we then say, here's a computer program that you can run with. So I think um, alternative spaces, educating people who are on these platforms, and looking into building more the um, social gaps that were identified that's where the investment really is in trying to make sure that as people come online, they actually know that they have alternatives as well. Just um, maybe to give an example of what this um, going away can mean or creating alternative platforms, um, there are feminist servers nowadays. So the idea is that you know if you can't have your uh, your content uh, hosted in a certain specific way, um, then and this is uh, becoming commoner and commoner. And it's, again, then we, we touch on another issue, which is, okay, who is actually creating technology? Who is designing technology? Do we have an, enough of these diverse groups uh, designing and creating technology? Um, women, young people, black people, um, just to chime in. For everybody, maybe, do we then risk fragmentation of the discourse? If, if everybody goes to their own silo, I, I know there's, we probably all are aware of these different pushes, like delete Facebook, delete whatever, and then we are left with what exactly? Uh, where, where do we go? Where do people go to talk to each other? Is there, is there a risk of that ver versus the current risk of siloing? So, so, sorry. so I think at the end of the day, the risk of siloing has emerged because of the idea that there was this one powerful entity that defined how to engage. And so therefore you've got that option of, if I play by the rules of what has been defined on these platforms, I also then risk self-censoring myself. And so then are my opinions going to, that freedom of opinion that was highlighted, which I, I'm going to carry everywhere with me from now on. But um, if then we want to, uh, one net, one vision, I was part of the approving panel for this slogan, but at the end of the day, one net, one vision, there's, the power issues mean that someone else has power to define that this is the kind of net we want. Not everyone who, say, the, um, say, Sir Tim Berners-Lee is my biggest boss, but it's always good to engage with him to actually point out that was this the vision that of what the web is right now? Is it what he had at that time? And if he had thought about it going beyond what it is, how do we ensure that even in that fragmentation, there's still conversation? So I think we need to recognize those differences that all of these spaces have rules that will leave other people out. What, what is the, the public sector, the government perspective on, on, on this? Unfortunately, no, no opinion to local government. It happens, I mean, this is not a topic that, that the governments are discussing uh, right now. Uh, the only thing I, I can say is, is the, the internet is already fragmented. We are not using the internet. We are using this specific app to do very specific things. And actually, most of my conversations, and I will say most of, of people in Colombian conversations, and maybe in other countries, are through WhatsApp. I mean, we are building uh, WhatsApp groups with 200 people. And then if, if I have one from, for this interest, and one for this interest, and one for this interest. So uh, as advertising is fragmented as well, uh, our interests are fragmented as well. So I, I know that I can 
talk about a very specific topic with with what uh, um, what kind of people, what I mean, and a specific type of people. And then if I if I do I want to do yoga, so I want to go to the yoga group, and then I talk about yoga with with those people. But this general. A general conversation. Maybe it happens sometimes when someone posts something, and then in the in the discussion part of the of the post, uh, I mean the answers to the post, people are discussing uh, briefly, and the in the, if they disagree, the they prefer to go and just leave the conversation. It's not about the the tool is it's about what are we are confronting the public discussions so this um, i mean we have biases for instance uh, we, uh, that prevent us to to engage in a public conversations because we want to be reinforced in an, in our arguments so I, I prefer to discuss with someone that is going to say that that the things i'm i'm saying are, are clever or or are right but then i fight a little bit but i'm tired of fighting and we are tired of fighting. There are a lot of polarization uh, on the public discourse, uh, politically, for, for religion. So maybe we're tired to being in this public internet. So we are relating with people that are thinking uh, uh, as ourselves. Thank you. And um, before we go to a Q and A with, with the room, but also remote participants, hopefully, I wanted to ask each one of you for a quick sort of blue sky scenario. What 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 should this online discourse, this participation for everybody look like? Just in maybe two sentences, starting with you, Amos. I, 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 I think that in order to kind of um, create an online discourse um, that we want, I cannot emphasize enough the need for looking at, um, you know, and, and, and remedying some of the structural gaps we see in incentives, but also in resources of bringing people online. Um, and some of the structural barriers are really important, right, to resolve before we even have a conversation about what kind of online discourse, you know, uh, people who aren't yet online would want. Um, one million dollar question. Um, I'll go with the take on a healthier public sphere. Um, if we do have a healthier public sphere outlined in the sense of polarization, in the sense of prejudice, in the sense of harm, in the sense of attacks to human rights, then we can also have a healthier public sphere online. Um, so, are we collecting the million dollars after this? <laughs> I don't have them with me right now, but <laughs> depends uh, on the answer. <laughs> so, I mean, a blue sky is um, a dis public discourse that allows for power to be critiqued and places people at the center taking into account context, body, and interests. So, centering people and not just looking at them as producers of, of data fumes or something like that. In terms of the what a government could do, uh, maybe be better are uh, giving or employing education, I mean, better and education systems, so people can build their voices, this one. Critical thinking as well. Um, fake news are, are damaging this public sphere so much, so uh, the fact that you can you can distinguish between good information and bad information make a lot of of sense. And as I mentioned, reducing all, I mean, trying to reduce all the social gaps and gender gaps in, in offline world. That, that Because the internet is not changing those gaps, are just incrementing those gaps. The internet is not an equalizer. The, the internet is, is not capable to equalize. The, the internet just amplifies what is happening in, in society. So I think we should work more offline to bridge those gaps, and then people are going to be better at, in public discourse when they are online. 
Thank you to all of you um, we, for, for this conversation. We now have uh, 20 to 25 minutes for questions from all of you. Um, to, to these four wonderful speakers. Please take the opportunity of them being basically captive over here and they can't walk away and they need to respond to your questions. Um, I also want to um, encourage the, my co-organizers in the room to ask questions, should they have some. Um, and, and Christian, maybe you can let us know whether um, there are questions online as well. Um, maybe we'll start with, are there any questions in, in, in queue um, in the app, Christian? No, not so far, okay. Um, so maybe we, we can um, start over here. Um, please raise your hand. We don't have um, name tags to raise, so uh, just raise your hand and I'll try to keep track of you. Over here, please say your name and... Okay, and uh, my name is Parsa Sajid and I'm a writer researcher uh, based in Dhaka, Bangladesh right now. Um, thank you, first of all, for a very engaging discussion. Uh, c coming from Bangladesh, uh, where actually, I mean, there, I mean, the internet use is very high um, compared to many Asian countries in Bangladesh. Um, if we do look at the data, there is a certain urban-rural gap we see. Um, there is a gender gap, but I would actually like to kind of hearing the, this discussion and kind of from my experience is um, for us to think about the pitfalls and cost of inclusion, for example. Um, in Bangladesh, for example, now, I mean, getting a, a phone and SIM is quite affordable. People actually have multiple SIM cards. But now, for in the last three, four years, because of a government regulation, to get a SIM card, you need to input your, like, you need to share your biometric information. And you get a SIM card against your national ID, which actually seriously, you know, affects kind of democratic space and participation. So people are, I mean, there is, you know, a lot of benefits to be on the internet. It, it is a necessity, it is a convenience, but at the same time it seriously hurts actually the kind of configuration of public space. Um, in terms of kind of language and inclusion, an example I can give kind of um, from Facebook users from my research I've seen. I mean, on Facebook you can actually quite easily kind of communicate in Bangla, right? But women, people who identify as queers, uh, for example, uh, have faced and systematically face kind of, you know, insults, slurs, threats of violence, harassment, uh, and these things are, if they are kind of, you know, said in Bangla, for example, Facebook has no intention, right, to kind of, you know, address, like, because if we talk to them, they'll say they have no capacity to kind of, you know, try to understand, like, what kind of, you know, uh, uh, in Bangla, for example, what is a slur and what is not? What is a threat and insult? They will say they have no capacity. I would say that they actually don't have the intention uh, to address this issue. So it's kind of just more than a language barrier because people can participate in Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever in Bangla, but the kinds of um, hostile situation they face, right? Uh, these platforms have, again, no intention of addressing that. And they kind of fall back on this, like, oh, it's, you know, we don't have the capacity to do it. Thank you. Does anybody want to respond to this? No? Yeah? Um, so just a quick response. Um, that exact, it's a point that I had wanted to raise in terms of like the, con the politics of moderators. Um, even though the AI is assisted to, I mean it's flagged and someone assists with it. I think the, the biggest challenge for me that I face is the context to which these moderators are coming from and missing those nuances. And even though, um, I, I don't know how Wikipedia, how many Wikipedia has, but I, I, I am for, in terms of like, uh, moderators that support when the AI is flagged. But I am fully aware that there is a need to unpack the politics of those moderators because we can't assume that just because you're given this job to prefect the internet that you are going to leave your politics and whatever biases you have. So I think those are some of the areas of research that we should really work on and thank you so much for reminding me to raise that point. Thank you, everybody, for, for your interventions. My name is John Weizmann from Wikimedia Germany. So, sorry, again, uh, the, the Wikimedia space asking a question, um, or two questions, actually. One, one would be, uh, Amos highlighted that um, a lot of the rulemaking is, 
is basically rulemaking by the advertising world because advertising is dominating in, in so many parts of the internet and the reason for that is um, obviously because it's, it's financing large parts of the internet. So that's what's paying for, uh, for that. So wouldn't it be also necessary to get to a new baseline of, of running the internet instead of on advertising money on something else? And what would that be? So that would be the first question. And, and the second question maybe to all of you, and especially for, for example, Chenna, you, you um, and, and also the others, uh, you sounded like it's, it's, a, it's a discussion about lack of capacity of those people coming online. But isn't it also a, a, a chance that, that some of those communities have not taken part in, uh, in, in the discussions of 10 years ago and are not biased in ways that we, for example, are biased when talking about rulemaking? So I think that is precisely the question that needs research and, and at some point in time advocacy, right? Because I don't think that we see discussions about what, well, I do think that we see discussions about what alternatives to um, advertising-based models um, of social media platforms or other kinds of internet platforms. Um, but I don't think we see enough of those discussions. I, I do think that, you know, there is, at least in certain contexts, and not to fall back on the Wikipedia example again, but um, there are, you know, um, kind of ideas about kind of community-led networks, right, that um, are volunteer-run. And even in um, contexts where there are financial incentives, such as in the case of Reddit, for example, um, it's a kind of radically, it, it's a, a, a much different way of kind of approaching um, how content is shared and accessed, right? In Reddit, for example, you have different subreddits where there is some level of community control over um, different streams of content rather than a top-down structure. So I think even within an ad-based model, there is, there is kind of still room for innovation on how we think about um, content can be um, accessed and moderated and um, um, accessed and moderated and um, distributed, yeah. Just maybe touching on your other question regarding lack of capacity. Um, I think it's, it's a problem talking specifically about young people. Um, it's a problem when we have very adult-centric approaches to what media literacy is, to what critical thinking is, to uh, how uh, we distinguish between good or bad quality information. Um, so maybe it's, I think, very important that we kind of, you know, take our glasses off and put young people's glasses um, to actually see what they are seeing in terms of what is good or bad content for them. Um, so just uh, an example in that sense, it's a, it's a research that we have been doing at um, at the Institute, but together with Conectados al Sur, which is um, a network of um, other researchers based in Latin America and also the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Um, and through this research, what we want is to understand from their perspective um, what uh, digital skills mean, what uh, good quality content, uh, content means, what are the lack of uh, content or, or, or content gaps that they see. Um, and in order to do so, we are using uh, workshops and uh, design thinking methodologies to actually, you know, we, we take, literally take <coughs> our shoes off and, and say, okay, what, what are your takes on this? Um, and sometimes what, um, I, I don't know, I think, Basically, every research that is done uh, of young people or about young people is not necessarily inclusive of young people in their very design. So we want to change uh, this, this notion, this very idea, so that we see from their perspective. And this is about young people, but it could be about any other uh, marginalized groups as the ones uh, we have been discussing here. So I think lack of capacity not necessarily means uh, what we think lack of capacity is. I mean, uh, just to add on to that as well, that I think sometimes, um, so I've 
done also done research on young people in African countries and how they engage online. It was four countries, um, Tanzania, Rwanda, Nigeria, and Kenya. And what I found interesting, I was actually learning in terms of their rules of engagement to actually circumvent when they've been kicked off a platform. This is how then they go and create a new persona or a new identity to be able to engage on the platform and some of the ways that they were using the internet to address these issues. So for me to hold back the mirror to myself is like, lack of capacity is what would fly in the policy context because this is what the language says. Therefore, if they're not adhering by these rules, they have a lack of capacity. But I do think it's a great opportunity because then you find that people are being innovative to actually, you know, as what Deborah was saying, that they're being innovative to actually participate in these spaces and to figure out how to engage and to take the best bits. So for example, um, a colleague of mine and myself, we set up a feminist in world African platform on WhatsApp because we knew that if we were to have it on Facebook, we would be kicked off, but we like know how to engage on Twitter. And we had even had our account Lock, like kicked off because we were from different places. But what we realized is that we were able to take best practices from different platforms that work for us. And because it's a smaller group, we were able to say to people, add on the rules that work for you. And the rules that people were coming with were not from online spaces. Rules around self-care, rules around um, acknowledging the stigma of leaving WhatsApp groups. Like I come from a society where if you leave a WhatsApp group, you're gonna be flagged for the rest of the, for the year. So then, it, taking that context into account and that is an opportunity that I think these platforms and Wikimedia is open to it as well and I know you guys support whose knowledge. So I think these are opportunities that those with power are able to actually take their rules and say, what does it really mean as new people are coming in online? So I think that is also an opportunity for everyone. Further questions in the room? So hello, this is Fabrice Tiber from ITS, the same institutions as Deborah. Um, I have a weird question, but it might be relevant. So it's about the agenda setting. Every time we put an agenda first, something rolls back. So I'll give one, one example. Yesterday we were discussing about 5G. So 5G should be a priority and so on. And at ITS we're discussing for five years connecting public schools to the internet. Half of the schools in Brazil were disconnected the other half just have two megabytes per second, which is administrative internet, not kids' internet. So thinking about this IGF, what do you think is the, um, one topic that you think, this is relevant to inclusion and other topics, but it should not be a priority? What kind of hype we might be seeing that it might lose the focus of something that is more important for inclusion? So the, framing the question is, if you could say something that you see everyone is talking about, but you think we should go back to basics and say there is something before, what would be this hype topic that you see in IGF uh, growing? And then maybe a minor alert saying, this is relevant, but let's not put this on top of agenda because something else should be in the agenda. So, huh. I mean, I, I, that's a really, important question. I think there are certain issues that are completely left. Certainly, I think it's been left off this year's IGF agenda, as far as I know, um, that kind of relate to the intersection between social economic rights and, and the internet, right? When we talk about, you know, access to knowledge, it also really depends on what kind of knowledge we are talking about, for example, um, in the context of the provision of essential public services, right? Um, you know, we are not necessarily talking, well, we are talking about privately run systems that are unaccountable in um, the delivery of public services services such as benefits, but, but I think there's a greater room to kind of also talk about, you know, what public run platforms um, for accessing benefits applications and welfare services should look like and how it should involve the very people that, um, you know, are effect directly affected by these platforms. Um, and I think those kinds of discussions just need to happen, right? But then in the context of what we are talking about, right, and 
um, kind of some of the issues around access to knowledge in the social media context. I think it's the framing that's very important. So we often think of YouTube as a social media platform, for example. But you know, I think there are certainly important questions about whether YouTube is also a labor platform, a digital labor platform, right? Because you're talking about people who are supplying content and making livelihood of content they are creating for YouTube as a result of the financial incentive structure that is put in place. And I think that goes for several other platforms as well, not just YouTube. Um, but so if we kind of shift the conversation, right, from, um, you know, some of the information related rights, but to also kind of include kind of conversations about labor rights, about what are the rights of YouTube creators, right, um, content creators, then I think that that in, in effect broadens our conversation about um, access to knowledge. Okay, so uh, being part of a planning committee for, <laughs> for this whole conference. Um, so I think for me, the, 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 in looking at inclusion and every other, because the, the three th thematic checks were data governance, inclusion, and uh, I think safety and security. So I think a lack of intersectional understanding of these issues. Because at the end of the day, if you're looking at data governance, to what extent is the, are the current models around uh, data inclusive and who exactly are they representing? And yesterday there was an example from a colleague from uh, Point of View Mumbai, um, and, she, and, and they pointed out that the level of inclusion at IGF starts from the sign-up form where, the, where it's uh, tick he or she, and they did not identify with that, and then the, the the ID, the document that they're supposed to present is that ID doc, is that ID document. Yet we're having discussions around um, digital IDs and the validity and who they leave out. So I think the for me, what takes it up a step, not of what's not left behind, is we're not having the conversation around the intersectionality of all of these issues and what it really means for people to be able to participate um, in these spaces. I uh, just want to add something very short. Um, we are talking here a, a, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. Um, but but I, I tend to think that in Colombia, we are so, so, so behind. And we have to figure out what to do tomorrow, not in 100 years, just tomorrow. Because we don't have artificial intelligence in our government that are working uh, today. But if we want to have this in 20 years, what should we do tomorrow? I mean, teach algorithms in the schools for, for children? I mean, very basic, or train teachers, or uh, do more data analytics, or, so those things that are, are before artificial intelligence, I mean, we have to do something else before to talk uh, of artificial intelligence. So those capacities, those skills that we have to form, the talent, the, the, the needed talent um, to build artificial intelligence in our, in our, in our own country, uh, yeah, we have to do many things before. Actually, we are now using other people algorithms. I mean, Euro European algorithms, Asian algorithms, Amer uh, North American algorithms, but you, you, we are not producing our own, our, uh, our own algorithms because we don't have the proper talent uh, to do it. So maybe we are like a 20 years behind. Any other questions in the room? Um, otherwise, looking at, the, at um, the clock here, we, we may go into a short summary or wrap up of, of the session uh, before we can leave you all out for lunch. Any further questions? Maybe also online? Nope. Okay, so inclusion of remote participants isn't, isn't great, apparently. Um, we'll try to do better next time. Uh, my name is Juliette. Sorry, the voice is going. Um, just one question. Earlier you mentioned um, the trend of parental mediation. It takes me back to the age when dial-up phones and the parent would sit right by the phone as you call me like, hello, friend. Um, how is that playing out in the online arena? Parents um, a very strong gatekeeper of information. Um, is this damaging for children who have to have that, excuse me, a level of, who have some kind of parental mediation in how they engage with the internet? Thanks. Um, 
questions. Um, if my other colleagues want to um, contribute as well. I think when we talk about parental medi mediation, it's also important not to say that it's something good or bad. Um, it means that um, it is important to have an idea of a shared responsibility between the child or that young person and their parents and the platforms and the government. So there are multiple layers of who is taking responsibility for what that uh, kid or young person is doing online. But she or he or they must uh, be included in, in, in that sense as well. So. Um, and maybe uh, another uh, <coughs> problematic to that is the fact that um, sometimes, many times, these parents are not the ones who uh, have enough digital literacy to understand what those kids are doing. Um, many cases, um, anecdotal here, my mom comes to me and say, how do I do this? And I have to at the same time teach her um, and imagine what happens to kids in that sense. So they are the ones who need to, at the same time, be teaching their parents of what that is, but be educating themselves about uh, what content or th skills they're going to develop online. Um, so that's another uh, problematic here. And I think it's very important because we talk a lot about digital literacy and media literacy to young people, but we're not talking it, about it you know, to other generations who are not digital natives, who don't um, know how to access and to actually uh, um, profit from what, what's good out there online. When I was in, in government, we had to deal with this uh, online child protection. And then we, do, we did a little bit of research and focus group, and, and we realized that parents uh, think that there are two different worlds, the online and, of, uh, and the offline. And the online is, of course, real. And it's here, and it's, it's even more dangerous. But they, they just think that there are two worlds, and in the internet, it's not, nothing's going to happen. And actually, uh, when they are busy, they just give a kid a tablet so they are quiet for a, for a, for a bit and, and they don't think that there is an actual world uh, inside. Uh, we would have a question from an online participant, and that would be to the panel. Um, what do you guys think on digital inclusion and those with special needs? And how should and how it uh, should fit into the core values of the internet. After all, it is meant for all. Cool. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? I can maybe just give an example. Um, so uh, at the um, Institute for Technology and Society, one of the things that we do is to uh, literally develop technology. Um, so we have mobile apps or platforms or um, chatbots. And this is something that concerns uh, us from the design of those technologies. Um, so it's important for the team to not only uh, seek knowledge in terms of how to uh, integrate uh, disabled people, but also to um, look for people who can actually tell us, again, it's, it's about these people's needs. Uh, it's about how they want to be included. Um, so just going back to uh, the other point I made about um, not having an adult-centric uh, perspective, it's about not having enabled uh, perspective as well. I, yeah, I think, I, I think that's a critical question that illuminate some of the tensions in current kind of digital rights discourse. Um, you know, when, you know, I spoke to disability rights groups in the UK about some research on universal credit, which is the UK welfare system, the objection wasn't that the government was moving uh, welfare benefits applications online, right? The objection was how it was being done because, you know, um, offline alternatives um, aren't really very beneficial for people generally and certainly not for people with disabilities, right? And moving um, and the, the migration online actually may help people with disabilities um, better access their benefits and manage their benefits. But the problem is that without adequate input, or input at all from people with disabilities, we end up with a very ableist um, um, kind of uh, system that you know overlooks 
uh, their needs or that are actively hostile to the needs of people with disabilities. And um, then I had another point which I completely forgot. So. Um, so, I mean, that's always a very good question and um, that always comes up. And I think one of the biggest challenges, speaking from a research perspective, is, is that we do often overlook um, people with disabilities. And even when we do say we're collecting data to inform um, evidence-based policy, it seems as if it's, it's the tools that we make use of are very difficult to get to. Um, we design tools that make it difficult to get to these communities where there's a need for intentionality to actually be able to say, if we want to have um, evidence-based policies that address for everybody, then we need to actually make, take into account the kind of tools that we have to ensure that we can reach these communities where if we're using surveys that are meant to be nationally representative, we might not always have access to the person who's differently abled. So I think, um, Probably I'm calling myself out, but I do think that there is need for more intentional research that actually does try to look at the intersectionalities. I mean, I champion gender, but to actually look at gender and disability. And I do know that, um, I've forgotten uh, the name of the article, but I do know my colleagues in India actually did start a specific um, article that looks around, that looks at how the people who are disabled are actually finding pleasure online, how they connect with communities and to move away from trying to just perceive them as not having some form of agency. So I do believe that there is need to invest in research to understand those issues. Um, regarding people with disabilities, um, I just want to bring, uh, I think, a successful case that we did in Colombia, and maybe it could be helpful for the rest. Um, we changed the approach from the demand to the supply. When you ask in the demand, you have to, I mean, people with disabilities have to ask government to do something and from supply, uh, the government just uh, uh, guarantee that all, all can access. So we buy a country license of a software uh, uh, for people with visual impairments, the, the famous JAWS, I don't know if you, if you know it. It's a very powerful software uh, that enable uh, blind people to access the internet. So instead of people having to ask for every single, I mean, for, for a license, which is very, very costly, we install uh, this license in every single computer uh, in the schools so people can go and, and study. Because people in school say, no, we don't have blind people. And of course you don't have blind people because you, you don't have the tools for people to study. So we decided to change the approach to the supply approach, and then we install the software in every single computer so people can, can access, and also, um, I mean, uh, creating a model with an uh, economy of scale, so we don't pay, li uh, pay license by license, but we get a, a, a good price for a country license. Uh, we, uh, the cost was like $1,500 per license per year, and then we get like just, just uh, $1 per license per year uh, doing this kind of e economy of scale. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad we, we did get a question online and, and um, a, a good one, actually. Um, thanks for sharing this. Um, we, we have about five minutes left um, till um, I guess we lose the room. Um, I want to turn over to uh, Christian Fiesler, um, who's a co-organizer and leads the uh, Nordic Center for Internet and Society in Oslo uh, for a quick summary and wrap up um, of our conversation. Yeah, I would like to wrap up the session a little bit with the summary of my impressions. Um, I think uh, we all had a very interesting discussion starting out on the matter of access, which I felt very much concerned about the idea first about urbanity um, as a divider in terms of where people have access to the internet and what type of internet. You raised the question of intersectionality as a lens to understand participation. And you raised a very important or interesting point about different levels of digital divide. I didn't know myself actually that we by now have seven levels, very interesting, where you essentially also pointed to the idea of intentionality. You continued um, with the idea of freedom of opinion, in particular also the um, question of who is protected and how do we essentially differentiate between the rights to have a civil discussion and to have legit 
or legitimate counter speech to certain uh, developments. And I think the discussion then went into the direction of incentive structures, the idea of what type of speech can be monetized, should be monetized, and whether that in any way, shape, or form has an incentive of what speech is actually allowed, which is um, given. Um, you had a very interesting discussion then leading into the overall opening up of the room of um, what type of platforms we want to have, especially when it comes to the capability of pushing boundaries. You mentioned the idea of exit alternative platforms, but also the um, question of whether that leads to any fragmentation, right? I think the consensus of the panel was very much we already have some type of fragmentation of the internet. However, these fragmented platforms are essentially the global players, right? Uh, WhatsApp was a commonly cited um, idea. I think going forward, or I think kind of like one of the big questions which then also came up in the overall discussion, I think might not only be one of access, but of speech and what type of speech can actually be monetized, right? Kind of like the connection of um, expression of opinion and um, finding remuneration in terms of uh, engagement on the internet. I think those were the, to me, very interesting points you raised. Thank you, Christian. And um, right on time, please join me in thanking our panelists, Amos, Deborah, Chennai, and Santiago for this interesting conversation, for taking the time. And also thank you for uh, joining us today. Hope you have a good rest of the day and of IGF. Thank you very much for coming to this session.